Hellions number 7 marks the first official entry in the X-Men Reign of X, the era following the Dawn of X and Ten of Swords in Hickman's X-Men. More than that, Hellions continues to cement its standing as not only one of the best X-Men comics, but one of my favorite Big Two comics of 2020. Today I'll answer, what happens to mutants who die in Araco slash Amenth slash does Marvel even know? What's next for the Hellions? What is the deal with Orphan Maker and his mutant abilities? And who are Cameron Hodge and the right? All of that is coming today on Crack and Krakoa. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel and podcast, or of course the Crack and Krakoa X-Men series, please consider liking and subscribing here on YouTube, and then commenting and letting me know your thoughts on the video, on the review, and of course on the comics themselves. Today we're going to be talking talking about Hellions number seven, this issue that again throws us into the reign of X. We have writers Zeb Wells, artist Stefan Segovia, colors David Curiel, and letters by Corey Pettit. Mr. Sinister here is making the world's saddest case to return his Hellions, who, of course, we see die in the pages of Ten of Swords in the previous Hellions number six, a tie-in chapter to the event area, loose tie-in chapter. Now, of course, Mr. Sinister's lamentations are, are overshadowed by the fact that we know Mr. Sinister was very much behind the death of the Hellions, in some cases, very directly <laughs> for uh, Empath, Grey Crow, and Havoc, and Psylocke, who all made it back to Krakoa, as Mr. Sinister says, before succumbing to their wounds. So it is confirmed here that the Hellions did die. In, those that did die uh, not on Krakoa did die in Araco. Okay, so there's Nanny, Orphan Maker, and Wild Child, members of the Hellions team. They fell in Araco. Now, why does this distinction matter at all? Well, it's not just Ameth, okay? So Araco. For those who are coming off of a Ten of Swords and you've already forgotten all the knowledge from this previous event, uh, is a, a nation, a mutant nation within the dimension of Amenth, okay? And I had questions, you know, so it was a geographical point of confusion that I definitely got lost in. There were questions around whether the characters who died abroad would face resurrection challenges, you know, the same way that people who die in Otherworld might, a la Rockslide and Gorgon. That's answered here, okay? It's very much a possibility if, as we'll come to see, there are some unique features, but they can be resurrected, okay? That's important. So we get some resurrection process stuff with the Five and with Professor X. And Professor X has some really interesting things to say, specifically about Orphan Maker, okay? Okay, this is the very young, kind of stilted, intellectual, uh, developing, you know, person who runs around in a suit of armor uh, at the behest of Nanny. And Professor X says, I refuse to see any mutant's abilities as anything less than a gift. But Peter, Peter has a curse, and he mustn't share it with the world. I mentioned during Ten of Swords that when Orphan Maker straight up had his arms ripped off by the Locust Vial, that I was disappointed. We didn't get some clue about what exactly his powers entailed, because they've always been this strange mystery. And that gets addressed after a fashion here, right? Professor X seems very genuinely concerned that Orphan Maker's mutant abilities could mean uh, really bad things for Krakoa and mutant kind. So we get some more details here on what they're calling the Iraqi resurrections, right? So for mutants who died in Iraqo, what actually happens? Because we learned when someone dies in Otherworld, okay, we can't quite bring them back the right way. The, things go wrong. Well, in the case of Wild Child and Nanny, it's actually almost the opposite. Instead, they come back almost at like peak perfection, okay? The word they use here is that they are honed Wild Child and Nanny, making them more of themselves. I mean, essentially, they level up in their ability, or so it seems in this early stage of their resurrection. As we'll see later in the comic, both Nanny and Wild Child are extremely efficient and effective now again here orphan makers x gene is mentioned to be something that cannot be activated okay and i thought i think this is really interesting because i i had always kind of assumed maybe just totally falsely that orphan maker you know x gene had activated and that the containment suit was keeping it in check when the reality it would seem is that the containment suit is preventing the x gene from even activating you know so somehow keeping it which would maybe apply to like the mental state of people as well keeping him in a like pre-teenage years um you know mentality for this you know what appears physically like a fully grown man it makes me wonder if peter's x gene is some sort of like legacy virus you know some sort of basically like he would just release a something into the ether that would be absolutely destructive to mutant kind because otherwise why would professor x be so incredibly afraid of it you know even activating and, and i think given that case too like if that's really what it is if it's that dangerous them kind of letting him run around with the Hellions is pretty crazy. 
You know, it's like they're caring for him, but if he's really that big a threat, um, letting him run around in situations where his XG might be activated, you know, and saying that cannot happen uh, in all caps, like, then why aren't you keeping a closer eye on Peter? <laughs> that seems like a pretty crazy gamble to be running, you know? So, like, all right, so all this is talking about Krakow mutants who died in Iraqo during Ten of Swords, but consider also the new foundation of Iraqo, which Apocalypse promised to Krakoa, okay? So at the end of Ten of Swords, in destruction, uh, Apocalypse makes a deal with Zatra and I basically saying, all right, I want Araco, this sentient mutant nation, to go join up with Krakoa again. And that means millions of mutants who live there are coming back. We don't really get a lot of insight into that in these two issues. But I'm curious, like, would mutants who have died in Araco, who were kind of native to that region, be a part of a crucible-like resurrection process as well as we continue to look at how mutant kind can expand their numbers? Okay, so Mr. Sinister, of course, won't tell the Hellions what really happened on their Ten of Swords mission, but him being sinister, you know, they don't trust him and are only really kept from beating an answer out of him by Psylocke, who continues to come to Sinister's defense in keeping the team aligned and obviously, like, protecting his person. This continues to be basically the only Marvel comic that consistently makes me laugh out loud. Uh, well, Zeb Wells here, the writer, has taken Hickman's amplification of Sinister and honed the comedy where this character is exactly the right balance of schemes and absurd clown tongue, as Exodus puts it. Plus, again, uh, here's Segovia on art the facial expressions selling the comedy are, are really nailed to perfection as is the lettering again when we do those little sinister asides lowering the font case just little things like that that really help sell how funny and compelling a book this is even while it's doing lots of sort of world building type stuff so we do also get confirmation here from sinister like why is psylocke coming to his defense uh, with such you know fervor and the reason is that sinister is keeping psylocke's daughter as Fallout from Fallen Angels, the five-issue miniseries that started off in the Dawn of X in 2019, which, hey, good on Zeb Wells for finding a sensible way to integrate that mini into his run. You know, it had been more or less forgotten by Marvel, like, as it was happening. And uh, I think Wells is going to take, like, small pieces of it here, give a reason why Psylocke can function in the Rick Flagg character, you know, on this Marvel Suicide Squad. And it's Sinister, you know, holding a, a daughter over her head. Now, I would anticipate here that Quanon doesn't stand for Sinister keeping her under his thumb forever, you know? And it is interesting to consider, too, like, the parallel where you have um, Professor X and Magneto telling Mystique, like, hey, we'll give you your wife back if you do what we want. That's what Mr. Sinister is doing here to Psylocke. So now you've got all these very powerful women, not all of them, but two in this case, uh, kind of being manipulated, right, and having these things lorded over them. I wonder if there could be something where they team together as part of a plot to say, no, this is this is not going to stand, and doing something to take them out of the picture, them being Professor X, Magneto, and Mr. Sinister. So the Hellion's next mission is to steal back Nanny's ship from the right so she can build Peter, a.k.a. Orphan Maker, another containment suit. It's interesting to me that, like, Forge isn't an option here. You know, it has to be technology specifically from the right. It sets up a fun mission, sure, and I'm here for that, but that's very specific. You know, it's a very specific thing to need. Appropriately, though, you know, if you go back and read Nanny and Orphan Maker's debuts in the pages of the Louis Simonson and Walt Simonson's work on X-Factor uh, if from, like, 86 to 89, the character Character's debut in the shadow of the right. You know, that is their origin. So in Nanny's case, she's forever tied to that terrorist group in her egg suit, which reminds me, shouts to Segovia for showing the resurrected Nanny still in her Krakoan egg instead of showing off what is assuredly the hottest of bots. We still do not know exactly what Nanny might look like outside of the egg containment unit. So it, when the Hellions go on this mission to infiltrate the right, uh, there's a big plan to, you know, how we get into their base. And Psylocke just sort of, it, again, kind of that thing of like, okay, Mr. Sinister doesn't own me. I'm still going to do things he doesn't want. In this case, that is crashing Sinister's jet and his beloved AI, aka Clive. Uh, not going to lie, I will miss Clive. Into the right space and, and opening up a hole. And then we see Nanny and Wild Child absolutely letting loose. So again, this is the Araco resurrection in action, where both of these characters now, whereas before they had mutant abilities and could hold their own in some capacity, I mean, now Nanny straight up is throwing haymakers, right? And taking down Wild Child. It's less shocking to see, right? He's always been feral and savage, but Nanny throwing haymakers is is pretty different. Uh, so it's interesting. Like they have leveled up, they have powered up in a way that I think is going to be very, very compelling moving forward. Um, and, and before we get to Cameron Hodge, I do want to say, like, okay, Nanny and and Wild Child. If if word gets out, and this comes up in X Factor, which is the other issue that came out today, if word gets out that like, hey, if you die in Araco. When you get resurrected, you come back like super powered, you know, like on top of your mutant abilities. 
doesn't that seem like a thing that some mutants might seek out? It's really interesting. We're seeing this thing now where, and we've seen it from the beginning, like mutants sometimes in Krakoa, they get resurrected and they kind of get these little tweaks that make them better or more efficient or, or raise their power levels, right? We saw this specifically with Sync. Uh, in, in one of the early issues of X-Men where it was like his power set is, you know, 5% more effective or whatever the metric was. And now seeing it with Nanny and Wildchild, it's, it's releasing this thing where like, yeah, the resurrection process is increasingly moving in a way that is like enhancing mutant abilities. And I think, you know, all of it is ultimately kind of going to build to that Chimera stage where Sinister is like, hey, you get Omega level Magneto powers and you get Omega level Magneto powers. But in the meantime, Here's what we have. So, all right. In this issue, though, Hel specifically Hellions number seven, Cameron Hodge shows up at the end. Now, H Hodge is a longtime X-Men adversary, beginning as a friend to Warren Worthington, an ally to X-Factor, only to betray them and reveal his absolute anti-mutant hatred. He is pretty famously bonded with both Cyborg Tech in the Extinction Agenda crossover event, and more intriguingly to me, the Phalanx, which stands out a ton given the importance of the Phalanx in the pages of Powers of Ten. Like, I don't know that it will come up again, but I'm very interested in seeing the fact that Hodge has bonded with the Phalanx before if having such an anti-mutant enemy will shape into the Powers of Ten narrative, you know, that as that storyline progresses. I mean, basically, otherwise, though, anytime there's a who's who of horrible bigots, Hodge is not far behind. The last I really remember of Hodge is working with Bastion in the pages of the X-Men Second Coming event circa 2020, 2011. So I actually think it's been a while. Admittedly, he's looking a bit better here, you know, these days than some of his previous appearances. I will give him that. So I, I am curious too, like of all of the look at what they've done, you know, mutant killers, right? And these leaders of terrorist bigoted organizations that have literally killed or decimated mutants in the case of, uh, you know, Wanda Maximoff. Um, we haven't actually seen a ton of them, I don't think. So Cameron Hodge is showing up here. We're going to get a story with the Hellions taken on him. We have seen Donald Pierce, I believe, uh, within the pages of Marauders. And of course, we've seen, you know, Genosha referenced uh, with Scarlet Witch specifically in Empire and X-Men as well. But it is interesting to me, like there's a lot of names on this board that haven't come up in the Dawn of X. And like they're they're taking on or now in the Reign of X and they're taking on new threats, certainly. Right. And I, I think that's been a good thing in the Hickman era of X-Men where we have these new threats like Xeno, right? And the Children of the Vault, which isn't literally new, but is a, you know, a thing that hasn't been developed a ton. Um, but seeing these old names coming up again, a Cameron Hodge specifically, you know, you look at like a list of humans who have committed major mutant crimes and you look at that number of Cameron Hodge on the right, 178, and then you compare it to like Bolivar Trask Sentinels and, and Wanda, you know, it's like close to a million. It's like, it almost feels statistically insignificant, but then it's like, that's 178 lives that they callously took out, right? And you have to sort of put in that context of, of the absolute damage and hate that they spread in the world in terms of what kind of threat they are. And, and that's what the Hellions, I'm, I'm glad, you know, couldn't happen to a nicer guy, right? Having Hodge face the Hellions, I think will be a good thing, especially with super powered wild child and nanny. Uh, here's to nanny getting to lay the uh, the finishing haymaker on on Warren's old friend, Cameron Hodge. So that's going to do it for Hellions number seven. I want to hear your thoughts in the comments for sure. Let me know what you think of this series, this issue, uh, kind of where we're going in the reign of X. Again, like we're starting a new era of X-Men comics here. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, it's like, it, this is still post house powers, Hickman X-Men, uh, but it's a, it's a new, you know, it's a new title, but it's also just kind of a new feel post 10 of sorts. So I'm curious what you think, where we're going, all that fun stuff. The Greek Cohen for the next issue reads smile wide, you know, which is definitely a reference to the right, that big smiling armor that all of their soldiers seem to wear. And I will mention here as well, I do have, uh, I did my reign of X promo teaser theories part one released this past weekend if you haven't checked out as cracking krakoa number 126 you can find it on the channel or in the playlist for all the x-men comics that i link in the show notes um but you know parts two and three i already have them done they've been done for you know since the weekend they are coming this weekend so i'm recording this on december 2nd they will come the weekend of this week okay and no i can't figure out what days those are that would be way too much math on the fly. Thanks everybody who supports Comic Book Herald and Crack and Krakoa. You can go over to patreon.com slash comic book herald for ways to support the site, which is greatly, greatly appreciated. In particular, thank you to the mysterious benefactors who support the site at the ten dollar a month level, which is very generous. You get your name read on the YouTube video for doing that. Thank you, Ron Paul Kirkley, Jesse W, Professor Pride, Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, Chris Isidro, Brent Bowser, Professor X3769, PD Appleseed. Thanks so much for your support. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald online. Look for the best comics ever in My Marvelous Year podcast. For more, hey, in the My Marvelous Year podcast right now, we are up to nine, we're finishing 1988. We're going into Marvel Comics of 1989, which means we're going to be reading X-Men Inferno, and we've seen Inferno teased a bunch 
in the Dawn of X here, now the Reign of X with Hickman's X-Men. If you want to join for reading the full Inferno event with the Comic Book Herald, My Marvelous Year Reading Club, come on in and join us now. It's a good time to hop on board and read some X-Men comics to get some of this history. So thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.